disciples to follow. In fact, it was a practice of rabbis at that time to give a specific prayer for their disciples to follow, a pattern in prayer uh, that would guide them. It wasn't exactly what they were supposed to say, because that would go against what Jesus said, saying, don't think you're going to be heard just because you use certain words. Uh, prayer is a communication between us and God. It's from our heart to the heart of God when we talk to him and we make requests to him, but there are all certain aspects of prayer. And uh, if you guys will give me just a break here. Um, my iPad was dead this morning, and so it's uh, dead, but uh, thanks to uh, the power company, it lives again. So. And I want to thank AC for putting an AC thing right here at the uh, podium, so that's awesome. Uh, Okay, let me just plug this in real fast so that we don't die in the middle of this. Okay. Uh, so we're looking at Matthew chapter 6. We're looking at what Jesus said about prayer, the, the disciples' prayer uh, that is given here. And this is actually a prayer we're supposed to follow uh, as we pray. And so Jesus told us uh, in verse 9, after giving some instructions in uh, some things we shouldn't do in prayer, uh, we shouldn't stand on a street corner uh, so that we're asking men to notice us in prayer. We shouldn't uh, repeat just things over and over again, thinking that we've got some magic potion or some magic uh, incantation that's going to let God hear us in prayer. Again, prayer is uh, our heart speaking to the heart of God, and we, we use words in the process, but you can even pray in your mind and God's hear, God hears you. And so he said in verse 9, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your transgressions. Okay, so we take a look here, and uh, one of the things we did last week was we started uh, through this, uh, this pattern of prayer that Jesus gives us. And uh, in that, uh, just as a reminder, the first half of this chapter, uh, verses 1 through about 18, is having to deal with how we walk with God or the ways that the means that we have of grace by walking with God and getting to know him better. And then the second half of the chapter is how we actually live this out in society and how we should walk before society in the things that we do and the things that we live for. Uh, so the second half deals with how we walk before God in that context. Last week we talked about how Jesus said that we should pray. He said when you pray, not if. So we know that it's a uh, it should be a, a part of our life in Christ. If we know the Lord, we should be talking to him in, in prayer. And uh, last week, uh, just as a review, we were looking at this time in prayer being similar to like uh, running a workout. I hate to, to use that because I don't want you to think it's that, but it would be kind of a spiritual workout for you. And, and each little thing that he gives is another lap in that workout. And there are actually seven laps, six and kind of a warm down lap. Uh, after we're done, and we, we looked at the first three last week. The first lap was approaching God our Father. Uh, we approach Him as our Father who is in heaven. We're coming to God as our Father, not as some distant deity that we have to appease. Uh, second lap, we praise God. We come to the Father in heaven, recognizing just how incredible and wonderful He is. We say, hallowed be thy name. That means holy is your name, different, other. God is definitely completely other than we are. Uh, we are made in him, his image, but uh, God is different than we are. He's holy, he's perfect, he's just, he's righteous. And, and we come thinking of that, and we come praying to him and giving him praise. The third lap is submission to God's reign and his will. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done. And actually, those are imperatives. And so we are praying as if we're saying, kingdom of God, come now in my life. Come now in this world. And it's an imperative as we talk to God and we say, and, and, and rule of God or will of God be done in this world, be done in my life. And so we're coming to the Lord, and, and what's really interesting is where we take a look at these first three things, 
Um, one of the things that, that too often people do in prayer is they rush into God's, uh, they rush into God's presence with all the requests. And if you'll take a look, the first three laps have absolutely nothing to do with your requests. It has everything to do with getting your focus where it needs to be on God and on who he is and on understanding who you're talking to. You're talking to your father who is in heaven. Uh, and, and we need to remember that. And it is our father, not my father. This is not an individualistic thing. One of the things that's, that's dangerous for Americans is, is we've got this whole idea that, you know, we can be that pioneer. We can be out on the edge. It's just us and nature, okay? But you need to understand that when, when Jesus saves us, he saves us, and we are baptized into his body by his Holy Spirit, and we become a part of a group. This whole idea of the Lone Ranger Christian out there kind of doing it on their own is patently unscriptural. There's, there's nothing that even remotely gives you that idea in the scriptures. And in the same way, when we come and we pray before God, it is our Father. We are here praying, but we are also praying as a part of the body of Christ. And, and you're a part of a local church, which is Calvary Chapel. But then beyond that, we're a part of the body of Christ. Because when Jesus looks down on Jonesboro, he doesn't see Calvary Chapel. He sees his church. And it has many different uh, ways that it's reflected in this city. It's all those who are born again, all those who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that's what he sees in this city. But individually, there are expressions of that church. We're one of them. We are part of the church. We are not the church. We are part of the church. Okay? And, and as a result, we should seek the Lord for what we're desiring in our own lives, but we should seek it with an understanding of we're trying to walk with God, and we're trying to walk with God in the midst of a group of people who are also trying to walk with God as well. And so when we, we look at that, it, it's, it's give us, uh, or our Father which is in heaven, that's that first lap. We praise God. We focus on his goodness. We focus on all the things he is. A lot of times we run into God's presence with a request or a prayer request if we would take some time to meditate on who he is and how great and how awesome he is you might find that a lot of those requests just kind of they go into nothing it's like oh no no wait a minute i've got my god that i look to i've got my god that i seek i got my god that i know and you know what this doesn't seem like quite the emergency it did before and we come with that idea, it, you know, one of the wonderful things you could do that would help your prayer life is take some time every day, choose one of the Psalms, find the Psalms that are primarily about praise of God. You can start about 97, go through about 113 or 14, and just take one of those and just use it to focus on God and pray and read a little bit and then use it to praise God and then read a little bit more and use it to praise God and read a little bit more and use it to praise God. And it's one of those things that's wonderful for us. Because you will come out of that with your faith being built up, with your, your image, understanding of who God is being, being bolstered. And then suddenly when you come in prayer to him, it's not, oh God, would you please do this for me? Please, 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 would you do this for me? We begin to understand who he is. We begin to meditate on who he is. It says if your father's, you know, if, if you go to your father and you say, can I have a fish? He's not going to give you a snake. If you go to your father, you ask him for a piece of bread. He's not going to give you a rock. And then it says if your father's being evil, knew how to treat their children right, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? By the way, if you want to know what the answer is to almost everything we face, it's that, it is this, being filled with the Holy Spirit and understanding what it means to walk in the Holy Spirit with the scriptures being your guide. You do that, and you'll, you'll have what you need to overcome everything you face. I'm not saying you're going to be all focused on the Holy Spirit, because who does the Holy Spirit want to praise? Anybody? Jesus. Holy Spirit wants to talk about Jesus. He doesn't want to talk about himself. This whole movement where we've got this movement on the Holy Spirit, and it's just all about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit 24-7. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. We can talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We can talk about what he does. But if you want to know who he is, he loves to give glory to Jesus Christ, and he loves to give glory to God the Father. And so one of the ways I know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit is you're talking about Jesus all the time. You're talking about God all the time. You're not constantly talking about the Holy Spirit. And so that, that second lap, we're praising God. That third lap, we say, God, I want your kingdom. I want your will. I want your rule and reign in my life. I want your rule and reign in my heart. 
And then we say, I also want your will. I don't want my will to be placed above yours. I want your will, God. And so we've come through those first three laps as we're praying. Again, we've not gotten to anything that we want, have we? So then we go to the next fourth lap. Give us this day our daily bread. This is where we're going to pick up from last week. God moves from himself to our daily needs. And I love where he starts. He starts with, and by the way, some people are like, yeah, but this has got to be spiritualized some way, right? Give us this day our daily bread. No, it's about having food and the things that you need. You want to get spiritual? Back up to verse 3. His kingdom reigning in your heart, his will reigning in your life. Hello? Go back to who God is. Go back to that he's your father. Focus on that. That, that deals with the spiritual in your life. Now he says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, God truly cares about every aspect of your life, from the grand and the glorious design of the universe down to your smallest need. Scripture says he knows the number of hairs on your head. For some of us, that's a little easier than for others. Okay? But he knows every hair that's on the top of your head. He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. God knows every minute detail of your life down to the smallest needs that you have, and he desires to meet those needs. Okay? Uh, we see, we request it. It's give us this day. That's a request. We are requesting something from God. We want God to provide our daily bread. And by this, we're acknowledging our need. We are acknowledging a desire for God's blessing. And basically, that blessing is our daily intake of bread, which, of course, is like the basic unit of food here that's being mentioned. And here's the other thing. It's our food. Now, we don't think about, God, give me today my daily bread. In fact, I was just quoting this to myself as I went to sleep each night. I was, I was just thinking about it, and I realized, God, I really don't ask you for my daily bread. And that's because in our culture, we have uh, grocery stores. And then when they don't have it at the grocery store, when the grocery store is closed, we have convenience stores. We have places that are open 24 hours a day. We even have bulk stores like Sam's, Okay, where you can buy food in the amount to where you buy a box of cereal about the size of this pulpit, you know, and you go, I need my, I need my cornflakes, you know, and you, you get, I know it's not that big, but those things are huge sometimes, and, and you go and you get a, a tremendous amount of food. Now, we know, many times we know, I know my wife usually knows the menu for the entire week. Some folks have a menu for an entire month. In fact, I think it was there was a movement for a while about once a month cooking. And it, and it was like, you know, and the husband, you know, when the wife says that, the husband said, well, it's not quite that bad, honey, maybe two or three times a month that you cook. But no, but this is where you cook for the entire month and you freeze it, you put it away, and you have cooked basically for your entire month. We don't think the way that I think God wants us to think, and that is give us today what we need for today. And by the way, if you have covering, okay, and you have food for that day, you should be content. That's what Scripture says. It doesn't say we have enough forever. Now, I'm not saying it's sin to have a bunch, but here's the dangers when we have a lot, okay? We become ungrateful for it. You know, we, come, we become ungrateful for just that, that basic meal to start the day. In the midst of much, God told his people again and again and again, you've become ungrateful. You know, that's why many of us uh, have, have learned, and I learned it from my parents, tried to pass it down to my kids, and that is that you, you ask the blessing on the food. But one of the things that you do is you also assume a blessing because you have food, okay? And, and I remember when we went to, when I went on a mission trip to South Sudan, I was helping with the South Sudanese army with their, their chaplains, and, you know, we didn't have tons of variety like we have in the United States. We had, we had uh, beans. Or what was it? We had beans and something else. Oh, man. But anyway, you had, you had beans and like a piece of bread for breakfast. Then you had beans and a piece of bread for lunch. And then to switch things up at supper, they gave you your piece of bread first, and then they gave you your beans. And it was fascinating how many of the Americans that came to teach at that 
started griping. Because it was like, you know, man, it's just being, and, they, and they fed us chicken one day, but it's not like our chicken, okay? And, and, and I missed the day where, where they actually had beef, and that was a funny day because I was teaching, and it was an open-air kind of setting, and, and it wasn't probably much further than the back of this auditorium where they were in the process. Of, see, I was committed to the meal that day. The cow was completely given over to the meal, okay? And while I was preaching, they were slaughtering the cow, on the other side of the compound. And I actually didn't get the cow because they had a, their, their intelligence missed a group that came through and they evacuated me in a matter of, they said I needed to be, leave, I would needed to be able to leave within four minutes of them telling me it was time to go. And so they just said, have everything to where you can rake it to wherever you need to go. They put me in a bulletproof vehicle and we were driving out of there in no time. And, and so you, you begin to live with this sense of, I deserve all the safety that I have. I deserve all the food that I have. I deserve all the, 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 the elegances and, and the, the extra things that I have in life. And, and the fact of the matter is, God says, if you have a shelter and food for the day, for that you should be grateful. And then he tells us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now, anybody knows if you're going to have that, you're going to have to plant a field you're going to have to cultivate the field. You're going to have to do all the things that create the bread. And that involves, you know, planning for much, much more. But I'll say this. I, I, I would think if you're a farmer, you better be somebody that knows how to pray. Because you don't have a spigot where you can turn on where your entire farm is watered. And we even learned that in this part of the country, there have been times where you have that and you have the irrigation, but then there's so little water that you can't even have the irrigation. And believe me, if, if God wants us to be humbled, he'll do what he did to Israel, and he won't let it rain for three and a half years. And there's not an irrigation anywhere on the planet that works in that circumstance. Saints, God wants us to be grateful for what we have. That's why we need to pray for daily bread. We become unaware of those who are in need of daily food. We, we just don't see it. And one of the things that, that God said that brought judgment to Sodom and Gomorrah was not the sexual immorality. It was that they had much and they ignored the poor. Did you know that was one of the reasons why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed? See, we want to make it, yeah, it's that whole homosexual thing. Okay, that was part of it. But one of their other problems was that they basically had much and they did not consider nor did they help those who were poor. By the way, when God uh, clarified the gospel in, in Jerusalem, he went to Paul and he said, Paul, here's the gospel. And he said, by the way, the other thing is that you would remember the poor. And Paul said that was the very thing that we longed to do, was to remember the poor. And so we become ungrateful. We become aware of those who have daily need of food. And then finally, we get to the point that we don't think we need God, or at least we don't need him daily. You know, you almost say, I got it, God. It's okay. You know? I know I'm supposed to pray for daily food and everything, but, but I've got it. I remember there was a, 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 it was one of the Fox uh, shows at night, and I'm trying to remember the name of them. I'm glad I can't. But anyway, uh, the, there was a little guy, Bart Simpson. It was the Simpsons. And the Simpsons were sitting around the, the dinner table. I don't watch the Simpsons, by the way. Somebody uh, told me about this, and so I went and watched it on YouTube. And Bart was sitting there, there at the table, and the dad said, okay, Bart, we, we want you to say the blessing. And then Bart bowed his head, and he said, well, God, we got the food at the grocery store. Dad worked for it. Mom cooked it. Thanks for nothing. See, that becomes the mentality at times. And we lose the joy of knowing that our God is providing for our needs. Our God is meeting our needs. Saints, it's so important that we get that. Manna, when God gave them bread in the wilderness, enough was given for each day, and there was only one day where they were given twice as much. Anybody remember that, that day? It would have been actually Friday because Saturday was the Sabbath, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And they gave them twice as much on Friday because of the Sabbath they weren't supposed to go out and work. But every other day of the week, if you actually kept some of the food overnight and tried to eat it the next day, it bred worms and it became foul. And then 
they began to wonder, well, what's going to happen when we're supposed to gather enough for two nights on Friday? God blessed them to where it lasted Friday and Saturday, and then Sunday, which is not their, their day of worship, they would go back out. It was the first day of the week. By the way, that's why our calendars start on Sunday for the beginning of the week, okay? Um, but anyway, let's, let's move on. Uh, manna was given because of a daily need of bread, but even more it was given so that they would live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8.3, God says this, He humbled you and let you be hungry, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. You see, the reason God wants us to pray for daily bread and he provides the daily bread, and he humbles us to the point of needing the food every day, is he's trying to help us understand man doesn't live by bread alone, but he lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that word in the Hebrew means it's proceeding, it's happening. In other words, you have the kind of relationship with God, not where you're making up scripture each day, but where you're seeking God, you're getting into the word, and what God does by his spirit is every day he gives you physical manna for your physical body, but he also gives you spiritual manna as you seek him in your quiet time, and he gives you the strength and he gives you what you need for that day. Now I'm going to make mention of my own sins. There are times I miss my quiet time. Actually, I study scripture for church but I don't get my quiet time in. And by the way, that's cheating, by the way, if you're a pastor, okay? That's not fair because I'm, I'm supposed to be preparing to teach God's word every week. I should have a daily time where I'm meeting with God to seek him. Now, I'm going to make mention of my sins to see if any of you have had this happen. Every time I don't have a quiet time, I usually have a rough day. Amen? Oh, me? I don't know, whichever one you want, Okay. Oh, it drives me crazy, and I'm so grateful that it drives me crazy. When that happens, a lot of times the next day, I'm reading what I should have read the day before because I'm very anal. I, I read some of the Old Testament, some of the New Testament, and then I pray, okay? So that happens. So I know what I should have read yesterday. And I'm telling you, every single time, the next day I read what I should have read yesterday and it was exactly what I needed for that day where I had so much trouble. I don't know if you've ever had that happen, but that happens to me so many times that I'm just kind of like, well, there it was. God had the manna. I just kind of woke up that day and said, eh, I got food, I got stuff, I'll just kind of do my other routine and I won't have seeking God as a part of it. Saints, God wants us to have that daily manna, that daily bread. God, give me my daily bread, and I need it not only for food, but God, I need that manna. In Deuteronomy 8, 16 through 28, later in that chapter, it says, In the wilderness, God fed you with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. Otherwise, you might say in your heart, My power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember that the Lord your God, it is he who's giving you power to make wealth so that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is in that day. So even in our culture where we work and then every week, every two weeks, once a month, you get a paycheck, we need to remember. And sometimes you ought to take your paycheck and just look at it or, or you know, I know a lot of you don't get a paycheck. It's like automatically deposited. Then take your phone and look at the deposit, okay? Whatever you have to do. And look at that and say, God, thank you for giving me the ability to make wealth. Because this is why I can buy the stuff I need. Thank you for giving me my daily bread. And I think it's just good for us to do that or else we're going to get caught up in this culture and caught up in this society. And the thing about this culture, saints, is it does not want to honor God. And it doesn't want you to remember God. And it would love for you to get caught up in the rat race so bad that you're just like everybody else walking through your day without God. By the way, I don't remember the guy who said it, but he was very smart. He said at the end of the day, when you win the rat race, you're still a rat, okay? So just don't get caught up in that. Live for something else. God said I was going to test you. Anyway, you make well. Anyway, we, we live on God's promises daily. David said this in Psalm 37, 25, and 26. I have been young, now I am, an old. Now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and gives. 
and his descendants are a blessing. When we live by God's daily bread, I love it. David said, young, now I'm old, never seen the righteous forsaken, never seen their kids begging for bread. Actually, what I watch is they're the ones that are giving to others. And their kids, they're just a blessing to the people who are around them. That's what God wants us to, to learn from a daily reliance, a daily dependence on him. God, by the way, and one of the things I thought was a good, good example uh, by one of the guys I read, he said, God gives his grace to you in installments, you know, daily ones. It's kind of like having a debit card rather than carry all your cash in your pockets, which, by the way, would be very dangerous and very foolish. Uh, we wind up going up and we can, we can call on that card to be provisioned through the day. We need to understand that God doesn't give us all the grace all at once. He gives us grace to be saved and to be born again, but then throughout our lives, he wants us to live in that daily dependence on him where we're calling him and we're saying, I need some more provision, I need some more provision, I need some more provision. Saints, every time you have a need during the day, you can shoot up a little prayer that is a continuation of seeking him in the morning and saying, God, give me today my daily bread. And we just ask him for the things we need all along during our day. Well, as, as we walk through this, we, we reach the end of that fourth lap, and that is God providing our daily needs. Let's look at the fifth lap, forgiveness from God and for others. Verse 12 says this, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And just for your understanding, when you go to Luke and you, you go to the same place where Luke looks and, and deals with the, the disciples' prayer, he says, forgive us our sins as we have forgive those who have sinned against us. So what are debts? Debts are here are the Greek word ophiliema. That means to owe something, something that is strictly due. And if you do not get it at the time you're supposed to, there will be an offense, there will be a penalty. This is not about money that is owed. It is about sins that are committed and the debt that we owe to God. And honestly, when someone sins against us, we think that they owe us a debt. Now, some may say, well, what about justification? I mean, why are we asking for sins to be forgiven when God forgave all our sins in Jesus Christ and made us righteous. And I would say to you, he did those things. But when Scripture talks about getting forgiveness from God, it's not talking about our salvation. It's talking about our relationship, okay? Now, on March 19th, okay, and I'm going to try something very dangerous, but on March 19th, 1983, I'm looking over here to check if she goes, nope. Okay, I think I got it right. I married Sherry Harris. By the way, outside of coming to know Jesus, best decision I ever made, okay? I committed to her to love her that day. And ever since, I have never had to ask her forgiveness for anything. And you go, no. And she's over there going, I'm just going to be quiet, and she's going to put up the little lightning rod because she's like, I think God will nail him, but I just don't want to get any, you know, side action going on. Now, it's astounding how many times I've had to ask her to forgive me. Each time she doesn't say, well, you've blown it, you know, and then I say, well, would you please forgive me? She said, after we get married all over again, because you've blown it from the last time. And I'm like, oh. So we've been married 7,468 times since March 19th, and I think that's giving me way more credit than I should get, okay? You're thinking, that's the goofiest thing I've ever heard. So is thinking that when you sin, you're lost. Now, the reason I ask Sherry for forgiveness on a fairly regular basis is because I want a relationship with her. We've already committed that there is an overarching thing that will not be broken. In fact, I always tell her, I said, if you ever leave me, I'm coming with you, okay? And, and that relationship is secure in the vows that we made before God. But here's the thing. You know what's not so secure? That ongoing relationship and the fact that we could actually be able to talk to each other. Because I know you've never had a time in your relationship with anybody where you couldn't even talk. It happens. And what you do is you come and you ask for forgiveness. You are indebted to that person because you've 
blown it in some way, you've sinned in some way, you ask them to forgive you and they grant you that forgiveness. Now, it's awesome that Jesus gave us a parable for this because he talked about the parable of these two guys who owed a lot of money. One owed billions and billions and billions of dollars to the king. And he went before the king. There was no way he'd ever be able to pay it. And he said to the king, please forgive me this debt. I'll try to repay it. The king's like, you're never going to be able to pay that. And he says, I grant you forgiveness. And it was a picture of what God does with us when Jesus saves us. Forgives us for more than we can ever imagine. Can't even com comprehend what was given to us. And so that guy that got that forgiveness from the king went out and found a fellow slave and he went to a slave and he grabbed him by the collar and he said, you owe me about 20 days of wages. Pay me what you owe me. And the guy said, please forgive me, I can't right now. I I'll, I'll get it together and I'll pay you. And he said, no, and he threw him in the debtor's prison. Now what happened was all the other slaves heard what this guy had done after the king had forgiven him for so much. And then they basically went to the king and they said, guess what happened? This is what happened. And the king came to the man and he said, I forgave you all that debt and you were unwilling to forgive your brother the little that he owed you. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you in prison. You're going to pay every last cent. In fact, you're going to be handed over to the torturers until you pay up every last cent. And then the scriptures say, God says, so will I do to you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. And now we understand, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We want to say to God, God, please forgive me for messing up, but oh, I want to punch so-and-so in the throat for what he did to me. In spirit, okay? We don't want to encourage violence. I'm just going to hold this grudge against him for the rest of my life. When I see him in Walmart, and I start going down the same aisle he is, I'm going to the next aisle. So man, what God says to us is, if you want to have a prayer life, and you want to have forgiveness, you've got to be willing to forgive the guy that owes you 20 bucks when you owe God 30 quadrillion. And so Jesus says to us, when we pray, pray Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And then we're going to see this again at the end of it. Then he goes on to the next part of it, okay, the next lap. And the next lap is this. The next lap is Jesus saying, okay, I want you to deal with temptation and with evil. And this is so great for us. There are two aspects of this. Don't lead us into temptation. The word for temptation here is actually a neutral word. It's governed by what comes after it. So it says, do, you know, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we're looking at this temptation as probably a temptation that's not a good one. Or you could look at it this way. God, don't lead me into a temptation that involves evil. Deliver me from that. But there are going to be a lot of temptations I'm going to have to face because they're tests. See, the other way this word is used, one is you're being tested to do evil. The other one is God is actually bringing a test into your life to see that you're growing. And to see that you're growing in your relationship with him. We have the promise of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but as such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. There is testing that we receive from God, and then there is temptation to do evil. God is not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able without a way of escape leading to where we can turn to him. I've heard people, and I've seen it on the internet recently, where people are in this argument. It says, you know, God, God will never give you more than you can handle. And people are like, no, that's just wrong. Well, let me, let me put it in this way. God will never give a believer more than he can handle without the way of escape also being there. That's biblical. And there's even a passage in 2 Corinthians 1 where Paul says, you know, we were, we were being tested to the point of, of being so under persecution that he said we despaired even of our own lives. But God did it. Now hear that. Because a lot of people point at that and say, see, that's why we know God will give you more than you can handle. No, read the whole passage and you'll get the whole idea. He said, God allowed this so that we would trust in God who raises from the dead. 
So really, unless you're trusting in your own strength, God is not going to send you more than you can handle. But he will send you enough that you can despair even of life. But even in that moment, understand God's trying to teach you something. And that is that we don't trust in ourselves, but we trust in a God that even if following Jesus means we die, he will raise us from the dead and he still gets the victory. Now that's actually the mentality of the Christian. The mentality of the American Christian is, God's not going to send me something that will make me miserable so I can be happy and I can wind up having health, wealth, and prosperity in all circumstances. That is not scriptural. Okay? But understand that God loves you enough that he may allow things in your life and the devil may come after you, the world may come after you, your own flesh may rise up. Okay? And, and begin messing with you. In all those circumstances, understand God is going to allow those things, but many times what he's trying to do is he's trying to have you take that next step in your faith, take that next step where you, where you wind up seeing victory. First, what we need to do is follow James 1, 13 through 18. It says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone. So if you're thinking God's tempting me to do sin, you're wrong. God is not involved in that in any way, shape, or form. That is one of three sources yourself and your flesh, the world system, which is anti-God, and the devil himself and his minions, all the, the unholy angels. They will bring a temptation to sin, but God himself will not. Then we read the rest of it. It says, but each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust, his own intense desires. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. In other words, we face our own desires, and, and when we uh, when we allow that in our life, it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And then it says, though, again, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good get thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. And so God is telling us when these difficulties come, you need to understand it may be God doing a test. Hallelujah, Father. Help me remember all the things that you've been teaching me. And what you're going to do is you're going to give me a way of escape and I will be able to endure it. And I will praise you at the end for the growth you're bringing into my life. Or I'm facing myself in my flesh, the world of the devil. I need to put those things to death. I need to understand it's through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that I have victory over those things. And then here's the big part. You can understand all that and still go down in flames. You have to say no in Jesus' name. Now, you don't have to do the in Jesus' name, but you have to say no. You have to make a choice. And the choice is yours if you're a believer. You don't make the choice. You mess with it. You're going down. Okay? A lot of people are like, you know, I don't have to deal with denying it immediately, I'll just mess around with it a little bit, and then they wind up in sin, and they're like, I just don't know what happened. Well, here's what happened. Let me give you another example. You see a rattlesnake. You think, it's dangerous, but he's cute. I'll pet it for a little bit. And so as you reach down to pick it up, and you pet it, and it reaches around, <laughs> bites you, and then you shake it off, and you go, man, how did that happen? Because you're stupid. You picked up a rattlesnake. Brainwave, you know, don't do that. When we mess with sin for a, little, for a little while and the temptation's there and we don't come at it with a hard, fast, no, this is outside of God's will. This is wrong. And we turn from it and we say, God, thank you that, that you put to death sin in me and sin was put to death by your power. Thank you for your cross. God, I, I thank you that I'm crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. Man, read through Romans 6, 7, and 8. Just rejoice at what God's done and all those things and then say a strong, hard, fast no and go the other direction. Listen, God says... Lead me not into temptation. In fact, what you should kind of read that as, then a better way of understanding is, lead me into temptation, but if it has to happen, deliver me from the evil one. If it's for a test for my growth, God, deliver me from the evil one. God, if it's because sin is coming after me, deliver me from evil or the evil one. And here's the thing. We need to change our language. Right? What do liberals do? Liberals change language, right? 
and they make words mean things that they don't mean. That's how killing a baby becomes pro-choice. It's still killing a baby. Now, here's our problem. We go into things where we're having a problem with sin or a difficulty with sin, and we say, boy, I've just got a problem where I mess up. Or I've got a problem where I goof. Or I've got a problem where I, where I just slip up. No, no, no. Here's what we need to say. It'll help us so much. I chose evil. And people are like, don't talk like that. That's not right. Well, it's biblical, and it's right. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from messing up. Nope, it's not what it says. Deliver me from, say it with me, evil. Because that's what you're choosing to do. Anytime you walk outside of God's will, you are choosing evil. Now, uh, the last thing that Jesus does, that last lap is, for yours is the kingdom and the glory, and the, or yours is the, I think the kingdom and the glory, or no, kingdom, somebody say what that middle word is, power and the glory forever. See, I used to be someone who went to one of those churches where they quoted the Lord's Prayer every week, and that was, that was the only time you prayed. And now I've forgotten part of it. Okay. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We're finishing up our prayer and saying, God, I've asked you these things, and hallelujah, it's about your kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. I need to follow you. I need to listen to the king. I need to follow what the king says. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. If I'm going to get through this stuff and I'm actually going to see victory in my life, if I'm going to walk with Jesus like I'm supposed to walk with Jesus, it will not be because of my power. It will be because of your power. And then yours is the glory. So if anything good comes out of all this, anything awesome comes out of this day, if I walk with Jesus through this day, God, all glory be to you. And then how long? Forever. And how do we end it? Amen. Let it be so. And then it just hits with your warm down lap. And by the way, if you don't forgive men their sins, neither will the Father forgive your sins. And so God hits that forgiveness thing. If you want to know what hinders revival more than anything, it is the issue. It's unforgiveness in the church. You know, you heard me tell the story about the guys, that, that the two brothers that were in the same church, hated each other's guts, and just wouldn't even talk to each other. And they were starting the revival meeting upstairs, and the guy that was leading the revival decided that he wanted to meet with these guys, so he told the pastor to start the revival service, and he met with these two guys. When they saw each other, they almost left the room immediately, and he said, nope, sit down. So he got him to sit down. Then he started praying with them and talking with them, and then these guys wound up breaking under the power of God's Holy Spirit, and they began getting right with each other. And they began asking each other for forgiveness, and they, and they mended that relationship that was so shattered and broken. And then as they got ready to go up the stairs, the pastor came down and said, you need to come up here. He said, what? And he said, well, all I know is about 20 minutes ago, and that was when these guys forgave each other and repented of their bitterness, he said, all I know is that about 20 minutes ago, the Spirit of God just fell on our meeting, and I need you up here because I'm not sure what to do with all this. And the church had revival for days. What was it that hindered it? Unforgiveness among the brethren. Saints, we've got to stop it. We've got to forgive one another. You were forgiven 20 Googleplex, okay? Anybody who sinned against you owes you about 20 bucks. Now, I'm not trying to make light of your circumstance. I'm just saying in light of what God did through Jesus Christ, it's like 20 bucks. Are we going to allow the Spirit of God to be grieved in our midst because we won't forgive 20 bucks when God has forgiven us trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions? That's how, that's how God wants us to pray. He wants us to pray to where we, we meet him, we understand who he is, we focus on him. Then we say, God, I need stuff for today. I need you for today. And we say, you know, and God, I, I need you to, to forgive me as I forgive others. And then, God, you know what? Lead me. Don't lead me into temptation. But if it's necessary for my growth, deliver me from making a choice of evil. Because, God, yours is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever. Amen. And, Lord, yes, sir, I will.
forgive. We start walking like that. God will turn our prayer times into times where his power is released. If we ignore it, pretty much keep what we've got. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for giving us this example, Lord. Thank you for knowing us better than we even know ourselves. Thank you for uh, approaching all the issues that needed to be approached for us to pray effectively. And thank you, Jesus, for giving us this pattern. Lord, forgive me that I don't follow the pattern enough. In fact, Lord, forgive me for all the times I just rushed into your presence with all the stuff that I thought was so important when what's most important is I grasp who you are. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for giving it to us. And God, give us grace that we would pray in this way. And we would pray, Lord, using this as our, as our pattern. And, and then, Lord, watching you take it all kinds of wonderful directions in our lives. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your goodness. Uh, Lord, I pray now, uh, God, thank you for all the things that people have brought. Thank you for this uh, Thanksgiving meal we're going to have. Uh, Lord, I thank you for Sarah. I thank you for the ladies that work the kitchen. I thank you for the men that helped set up tables. And I know there were a couple, two or three ladies that just worked so hard in decorating things to make it special, Lord. I pray you'll just make it a special time. Bless the food. Lord, bless the fellowship that we have. And Lord, may our tables be filled with gratefulness and thanksgiving and joy and fellowship over our common Lord. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.